All right, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Schroeder from the Rothman Institute and Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Uh, we'd like to thank the Seattle Science Foundation for having us. Uh, I think this is the third um, Rothman Institute um, webinar, so we're happy to be a part of it. Um, today, myself, uh, Dr. Hillebrand and Dr. Victor Shu uh, will kind of be helping guide us through a discussion on revision spine surgery. Um, so just a little bit of background before we get into kind of a case uh, discussion. So right, we all know lumbar spine surgery is increasing across the United States. And it kind of goes without saying that as the number of primary surgeries increase, the number of revision surgeries are gonna increase as well. Um, you know, the challenging thing when we talk about revision spine surgery is there's such a heterogeneous population, right? So you'll see somebody talking about a revision lumbar surgery and it may be this, this person had an L5 S1 micro disc 20 years ago, and now they have severe stenosis from L1 to L5, right? This is a very different population than say this, which is somebody who had a infection at L5 before they had a big surgery in the front and then they developed a non-union at L3, L4, you know, or this was one of my favorite cases recently where somebody had had a four or five spondy they developed adjacent segment disease. They did a standalone lateral and fractured the body, um, right? But if you try to read in the literature and kind of determine what's going on, all of these cases are, you know, technically revision lumbar surgery. And it makes it really challenging to do kind of an evidence-based approach for what is the best way to treat these patients because they really are a, a very heterogeneous group. Um, and because of that, I think really a case-by-case -case approach is often needed. And we're going to try to go through uh, four cases that were uh, all treated, you know, very differently today to kind of talk about the pros and cons and how everybody here would, would handle these. Um, you know, when I think about revision lumbar surgery, um, I kind of try to go through an algorithm in my head. All patients, no matter what, need AP lateral flexion extension radiographs. Uh, if the patient had a previous fusion, even if it's just an L4-5 fusion, I usually obtain scoliosis radiographs just so that I can really have a full understanding of what's going on um, with their sagittal balance. I think this is really important because sometimes we forget all patients need both MRIs and CT scans. Uh, the CT scans, I think, are critically important for two reasons. One, they really let you know where the bony defects are, but two, oftentimes they let you know if the bones are fused. For me, I can't stand going into the OR and changing my surgical plan. Um, so if I have all of this, it really helps me know um, what the plan is so I can really design it before surgery and execute it at surgery. Um, I don't routinely get CT scans on primary cases, but I think it's really helpful for the revision. Um, another thing that I think is critical is if you know what the previous fusion is, find out the hardware. You know, there are a lot of old systems um, that you look at and you're like, oh, well, whatever, we'll have our universal screw set removal. And it's just not that easy to get out. Um, last couple of comments I would make is you really do have to tailor your treatment towards the patient for this um, and really try to not badmouth the previous surgeon. Patients always come in and ask me things like, well, was there something wrong? You know, why did I break down? Listen, I am sure I have got lots of x-rays over the last five years that if they showed up in Vic's clinic, it would look terrible. Um, you know, that doesn't mean it didn't look perfect for the first year that they were following me. Um, so just kind of be cognizant of that. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to have Dr. Basque talk about uh, a case that uh, one of my partners did that I would never do it this way. <laughs> well, thanks for the introduction, Dr. Schroeder. Um, so let me see. So, uh, so I'm Bryce. I'm uh, one of the spine fellows at Rothman this year. And um, this is a case that uh, Dr. Vaccaro uh, asked me to present. And so without further ado, let's get into it. So this is a 61 year old female who has had three years of uh, ongoing right more than left leg pain. Uh, the pain is primarily over the anterior lateral thighs, knees and medial calves, kind of in an L4-ish type distribution. Um, it's worth with, worse with walking, better with sitting and rest. It's associated with numbness and tingling. There's no frank weakness. Uh, does not report any red flags, such as fever, weight loss, bowel and bladder issues. And to date, uh, the patient has had uh, multiple bouts of conservative management, including epidurals, PT, and says acupuncture and chiropractic care. 
See if I can make this go forward. Okay, so um, some history. So just the history of uh, hypertension. Um, surgical history is a prior L45 uh, posterior lumbar decompression fusion by another surgeon 12 years ago. Is currently on lisinopril for hypertension, no allergies, works full time as an engineer, no smoking, drinks alcohol socially. So on exam, as I mentioned, she's a 61 year old female, um, uh, mildly obese, BMI 32, normal standing posture, normal gait, uh, well healed midline surgical scar of the lumbar spine, no tenderness to palpation posteriorly. Uh, lumbar range of motion is 40 degrees flexion, extension to neutral, uh, 20 degrees of lateral bending and rotation. Uh, some very mild weakness in the bilateral quads, Tibant and EHL, um, otherwise five out of five strength and sensations intact to light touch bilaterally, reflexes are symmetric, um, no long track signs, um, negative clonus, negative straight leg raise, and palpable pulses distally. So these are the initial x-rays uh, when the patient presented to our office. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this is a uh, relatively standard posterior lateral um, fusion construct with uh, paired pedicle screws and rods in the four or five. And this is the corresponding MRI. I saw on the left is the sagittal view demonstrating uh, probably just about a grade two spinal anesthesis um, at the uh, proximal adjacent level to the fusion construct at three, four. Um, and then on the axial cut through the three, four level, you can see that there is um, a fair amount of a central lateral recess uh, stenosis seen. So at this point, um, you know, we'll kind of see a number of different options uh, later on but probably uh, some of the more common options that we would consider at this point would be uh, just simply an extension of decompression and fusion. Uh, so just the extension of the posterior lateral fusion uh, approximately one level um, without any type of uh, interbody uh, device or fusion. Um, one could also consider a T-lift uh, at the super adjacent level. Um, and then there's also more anterior approaches such as an ALIF or um, a, a, a direct lateral approach. So the option that was chosen here um, was actually a, um, so a revision anterior posterior. So essentially um, going in and uh, doing an ALIF at three, four at the supra adjacent level, uh, and then going posteriorly and uh, doing pedicle screw fixation up to um, L3 and then revising the screws down to L5 with rods um, and then extending the decompression up uh, through three as well. So uh, these are kind of the before and after. And so you can see one of the advantages of doing this uh, 360 uh, decompression fusion type procedure is you do get a nice uh, correction of the spinal anesthesis. Um, you get a nice um, correction of the uh, lumbar lordosis here. Um, so that is one of the benefits of, of kind of a full anterior release in addition to the posterior fixation. And just some selected articles from literature, just very briefly. So this is a, um, a study that was done a couple of years ago. It's a retrospective study of the French Spine Surgery Society series, 3,000 patients, seven years follow-up. Um, primary outcome was uh, risk of clinical uh, adjacent segment disease requiring surgery. And the rate of ASD um, uh, requiring surgery was about 5.6%. And the risk factors were increased age, uh, degenerative spinal anesthesis versus other um, diagnoses for the index procedure, such as um, just simple stenosis or um, isthmic spinal anesthesis, and also fusion down at the S1 level uh, was associated with um, uh, ASD. Another article, a slightly longer follow-up, so this is a 10-year follow-up study, retrospective case series um, out of spine, 2018. So this is 128 patients who had a, a posterior lumbar um, with the interbody fusion uh, for four or five uh, degenerative spinal anesthesis. Um, and essentially two years, ASD was 5%, five years was 9%, and 10 years was 15%. Um, and then typically the operative adjacent segment disease was more commonly at the uh, cranial segment, uh, so 77%. Okay. And the operative um, adjacent segment uh, diagnosis was typically spinal anesthesis. 
Another study, uh, this is just a kind of one of the rationales for why um, anterior uh, approach was chosen for this is that um, there is an, uh, kind of a risk factor for adjacent segment disease in spinal pelvic uh, sagittal impa uh, imbalance. As this was a uh, one to five match case control study of 20 patients who had revision surgery for ASD after uh, L4-5 uh, posterior fusion to 100 patients who had um, no ASD. And uh, the preoperative global sagittal imbalance, basically aberrations of the sagittal parameters were associated with uh, worse outcomes and uh, development of ASD. And then lastly, um, this is a study just comparing the um, uh, different surgical approaches for radiographic parameters after a single level uh, lumbar fusion. And as one would expect, um, doing a more anteriorly based procedure, either a full anterior release with an ALIF or um, a direct lateral approach um, with a more thorough anterior discectomy was associated with uh, greater improvements in radiographic measurements compared to um, entirely posteriorly based approaches. And ALIF was actually the most successful in improving uh, the PILL mismatch. Bryce, I mean, great job. Thanks, man. I'm just curious with the panel, would anybody else have done an ALIF in this case? I mean, it, it certainly is an option. Um, you know, I, I don't have any problem with what was done, but my only concern is that they took the decompression all the way up to the inferior lamina of the next level. They removed the spinous process, the interspinous ligaments, and of course the ligamentum flavum. So her only restraint is at the three, four. And when I've gotten in trouble with these uh, progressive slips is when I have done the total decompression up to the next level. So I learned after a couple of times, it wasn't a good idea to do. So I'm just curious uh, if anybody else feels the same way. So, yeah, so do you try to just leave like, I mean, I always try to leave about two millimeters or three millimeters, a little bit of the spinous process and the lamina left. Um, just because I, I, I think that you can get the decompression up to kind of the bottom aspect of the pedicle without going past that. Um, and it makes it even if you have to come back in easier. Um, so, I mean, I, I would agree with you that I would try to leave a little bit there. Yeah, I usually, I usually go to where the ligament and flavum inserts, take that down, and then um, I, I don't know, I probably wouldn't have gone anterior uh, with an A lift. I probably would have been a T lift. That just, my you know, I think we would have done an indirect decompression on this. We probably would have done the ALIF um, and then uh, relied on our reduction to decompress the canal, especially uh, um, a canal that showed a listhesis, even with the patient in a supine MRI scanner. I think with the reduction you got, that was probably a good enough decompression. Um, but I think you also, you have to be real careful when you take down uh, the ligamentous connection to the next level up with a two level lever arm below it. I think it's a setup for a future instability. So would you have put screws in the back too, or would you uh -huh. have just done an indirect and- No, we've done the, no, we, we would have fixed it from back behind. it up with perk screws. Yeah, but just stay out of the canal, Greg. And we've had real good success with that. Rarely um, have to go back for a decompression. I mean, yeah, she, she had pretty funky facet joints, but her central canal wasn't all that bad. And as Jack said, I think that just the distraction or reduction would have gotten her reasonable um, decompression indirectly. Yeah, and I maybe not have done this from the lateral just because I think you can get about as good of a reduction from the lateral. And it's just three, four from the front is pretty morbid in my hands, at least, um, or my general surgeon's hands, if you will. Um, so I, I think where I do a lot of five ones and four fives from the front, um, once you start getting up to three, four, I start looking for different ways to do it. I wouldn't and, hesitate and I don't know how... to go anteriorly on this one. Um, it's pretty straightforward as everything that was said up to now. Uh, the one thing that I'd always be concerned about, uh, why did that fall apart above? And yeah, you mentioned the posterior tension bend, but if you look at the placement of those initial pedicle screws, they look like they were right on impinging on the facet joints at three, four. So I suspect that that may have contributed to the failure. Well, and if you look at the reconstruction, the pedicle screws at the next level were pretty much straight in also. So you worry kind of about the, the next level, not only from the ligamentous standpoint, like Rick mentioned, but the screws look pretty, pretty straight full, you know, straight in as well. So, you know, I think both points are very well taken. I will say that most or a lot of the Rothman guys start their uh, screws just a little bit lateral to the facet and are, it's a more straight in uh, trajectory than, than some other places. So I think if you look at a lot of our screws, they look more that way. So, all right, do we just want to go on to the next case? 
Sure. All right, so I'll be presenting the next case. Um, my name is Derek. I'm one of the spine fellows. So let's see a different approach to a very similar problem. All right, so we have a 69 year old male who uh, presented to our clinic. Um, he sat us post an L3 to 5 posterior lumbar decompression infusion in 2018, so only two years ago at another institution who presented with. Uh, worsening bilateral foot weakness, leg pain, buttock pain, and as well as numbness and tingling going down the posterior legs to the feet. Um, he had um, baseline bilateral foot drops since prior to the first surgery, but he thinks that his right foot, his ankle weakness is getting worse, and otherwise no bowel or body changes, and he's tried physical therapy with that relief, but he's really concerned about his weakness and his increasing pain. On examination, he has a well-heeled posterior incision. On his right lower extremity, he's uh, profoundly weak. Two out of five tib, tib ant, one out of five EHL, as well as four out of five gastroc. And a similar story on the left side, uh, not as uh, weak, but three out of five tib ant, two out of five EHL, and four out of five gastroc. He has decreased sensation over the dorsum of bilateral feet. Otherwise, he has intact pulses and he has intact reflex feet. So here's the x-rays we got in clinic. Um, he has uh, three to five uh, posterior fusion. Um, otherwise, we don't have a CT scan to look at the fusion mass, but um, we have an MRI coming up. An MRI shows pr pretty profound stenosis above that level. So at level two, three, he has um, tricompartmental stenosis. He has a facet cyst on the left side. Um, otherwise, the hardware looks fine. He has some uh, fluid in that facet as well. Another notable thing was at 5-1, where he was reporting some increased weakness on the right side. He had very severe foraminal stenosis at 5-1. Otherwise, at 3 to 5, the central canal looked wide open. So our diagnosis was uh, adjacent segment disease, you know, L2-3 central and foraminal stenosis above the prior L3 to 5 posterior decompression infusion, as well as right-sided L5 to S1 foraminal stenosis. So uh, similar you know, thought process to what Bryce had, had spoken about before, but uh, in this case, um, the plan was to, to do a T-lift and extension of the fusion at 2-3, at two uh, um, and, and then just decompress the right side at L5-1 uh, for the foraminal stenosis. Um, so interoperatively, that's basically what we did. The only other thing was that during the expiration of the fusion mass, there was a uh, pretty pretty obvious non-union at L3-4 with just grossly loose screws. Um, otherwise, it was solidly fused at L4-5. So we did a T-lift at two levels, um, uh, two, three, as well as a revision fusion at 3-4 um, through the, the prior decompression. Um, and we added BMP to the T-lift, which we usually do not do just because of the non-union. And here are the final x-rays um, interoperatively. Um, so we got good correction, um, replaced the screws and upsized them. And otherwise, um, it's only been a few weeks with the patient doing well. So Derek, I mean, to me, this is a case exactly of why you need to make sure you get the CT scan, right? I mean, obviously you can do a T-lift at that level, but when I'm doing kind of revision spine surgery, the most challenging part is the index level revision decompression. And you probably didn't have to do that if you'd have gotten a CT scan, saw it was not healed before, and whether you did an A-lift or an X-lift, you really didn't need to get into the canal at uh, three, four, but now all of a sudden you're in surgery and you realize that that's a problem. Um, so for me, I, if I see somebody who has a non-union at that level and the adjacent segment disease, that would have been a slam dunk two level X lift be, or lateral, direct lateral, because you don't have to get into the canal then at all. You probably have to get into the canal at the facet cyst. I would take that out. Um, but I think you'd restore their sagittal alignment better and you'd it'd be in my hands a little bit safer. I totally agree. And then the other question I'd ask is, do other people feel as unsatisfied? I, you said you did 5-1 foraminotomy, L5 foraminotomies, correct? That's correct. Do other people feel as unsatisfied with a five, an L5 foraminotomy as opposed to 
just doing an a lift at 5-1 and, and getting that secondary decompression of the neural foramen just by getting disc height at 5-1 and lordosis for that matter. Totally agree. And I'm afraid that's going to break down at 5-1 now. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> like it's been decompressed twice there already. Well, you know, sort of a two-edged sword, Greg, if, if they went down to 5-1, and I do agree with Scott, it's not very satisfying when you try to do your foraminotomies as hard as you try and whatever instruments you use, whether it's Masonic hook or whatever, uh, it's just not satisfying. But if you if they fused already down to five one, then they're going to break down at one two. So if they didn't fuse the five one, it might break down. You do five one. It either this is one of those you know judgment call kind of deals, unfortunately. Totally. And, and this patient will be back for another surgery at some point. Isn't that what you say, Rick? That's why you call it back surgery because they keep coming back. <laughs> no, that, that's what our, our PA says. <laughs> Mrs. Jones, the reason why they call back surgery, you keep coming back. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> why well, let the dentists get all the repeat business? <laughs> all right, any other comments on that one? No, and what, Greg, how do you counsel your patients? Do you tell them that, <clears throat> hey, this is what we're doing and uh, hopefully this is going to last for you know, good while, but it's possible that you may have breakdown and need more surgery. I think that's what we have to tell the patients. Oh, my, my, I tell all the people, you know, listen, if you're already on, I can't remember this is his second or third surgery. If you're already on your third surgery, this is probably not your last surgery. Um, you know, we'll do everything we can to get you in a good position. Um, but, you know, the natural history is your arthritis is clearly progressing. It's progressed before. Um, it's probably going to continue to progress and I'll be here to try to help take care of you when it does. I mean, he did Rick, all the you, things. Are you evaluating your patients with full length, three foot standing x-rays before the revisions? I, I, every fusion I do. Yeah. That's, um, I think that's very important in the decision-making and looking at this, uh, we don't know where his head is on these x-rays and one looks like it's still an interop film so he's still on the table so you really have no idea what's going on at l5s1 or even above uh, even though you're two to five looks like you've got some lordosis there uh, i suspect he's going to still be pitched forward and sagittally imbalanced Pelvic incidence doesn't look like it's off that far, I think, from the from the overall lordosis, if you were to measure, if you look at where his hips are, though. I mean, I I know that, you know, that's sort of out of favor, but I think that still plays a role and is something you can use based on the information well, in front of us. And I and look, I mean, I would say, look, this guy has a well-preserved disc at 5-1. They didn't take the lamina 5, so 5-1 connections are theoretically intact. You know, I mean, it improves the chances of surviving it, but I agree. I mean, you know, look, everything can wear out eventually. Well, he's got no lordosis at 5-1 right now. And this is a picture on the table. So if you look at the AP, his pelvis is retroverted on the table right there. You look at that, that view that you're looking at. Uh, the lateral, it, it's, it's hard to tell where everything is, but that's where you've got to get the pre-op film and pre-plan and exactly figure out what kind of correction you want to get your sagittal axis uh, in, in a neutral position for them. But I do I tell people, right, if I do two to one, I do two to the pelvis. And so I think there's a, a fairly significant difference between what was done here, which is, you know, targeting the area that was his most symptomatic and treating it and saying, listen, we may be back and doing a two to two to the pelvis. So. Hey, Greg. So this is a great case. There's so many good discussion points here. And especially the quandary of 5-1 uh, below longer fusions was well addressed. How much do you use electrodiagnostics in these kind of patients to try to guide uh, whether you want to give them an all-out decompression um, at, say, for instance, an acute versus a chronic radiculopathy or no radiculopathy? Uh, is, does that play a role in your algorithmic uh, approach? It doesn't play a role in my algorithmic approach. What I learned from Alex is we decompress everybody primarily everywhere. <laughs> maybe that's not the right answer but that's the that's the answer that i learned six years five years ago um do you jens do you get a emg and decide whether they have a, 
uh, chronic or uh, acute issue? I, I, I tell you, so I do like CT myelograms. I do like EMGs, and it helps me get to know my patients, especially when they're not my patients and they come to me as an outsider. Uh, having the needle provocations does help me understand where their resiliences lie. Um, it does help me get a bigger gestalt picture of the patient. And certainly in terms of recovery potential, we have some very good electrodiagnosticians. So if this is a burned out chronic radiculopathy uh, with very poor amplitudes, I'm going to tell them your chances of recovery are probably not great. I'm going to try my best to we'll have those BRGs floating naked in the breeze and we'll protect you with a nice fusion. But uh, I am cautious about um, uh, making any prognostications. So yes, it does help me counsel the patient and yes, it does help me get to know them. If somebody can't handle the EMG and uh, has horrible CT myelogram problems, I'm probably gonna say, you know, let's just uh, work on our functional restoration program here a little bit longer, uh, unless there's a prohibitive neurology or instability. So, so I, I do find a personal merit in these more invasive diagnostic studies to get a comprehensive picture before I decide on a, uh, in a procedure. So those are just my personal thoughts in that realm. Oh, it's a great thought, Jens, thanks. All right, can we go on to the next case, guys? Hello, everybody. M my name's Jose, I'm one of the other spine fellows at Rothman this year. And um, I'll present a case that I with Dr. Schroeder. Um, it's a, um, the case is a seven-year-old female that had post laminectomy syndrome, DJ and Scully, and she had had a couple, a few years back, an L24 fusion that at this point had a pseudoarthrosis, and she's presented with severe L12 stenosis. Um, let's try to go to the next one. So again, uh, patient presented to her clinic, and she had significant recurrent back pain. It was radiating only to her right lower extremity. She had the history of L24 PLDF a few years in the past by another surgeon. Um, right now, she had pain with a prolonged walking and standing, and it was, you know, improved with the rest, mostly right anterior thigh, L1, 2, dermatome, and it did have paresthesias and weakness. Um, we had done extensive non-operative management, she had an PT and injections, and, and, and at this point, she was um, uh, considering surgical intervention. Not major past medical history for her age. Um, and on exam, you know, she was... Um, an appropriate weight for the uh, interventions that we're planning of doing. Um, the thoracic lumbar spine, she had a well healed scar. Um, she appeared straight in coronal plane uh, and normal sagittal balance. Uh, her level shoulder, her shoulders and the pelvis were level. She had no tenderness to palpation, pretty decent range of motion. Um, um, she had a normal um, heel to toe and tandem gait, um, positive set leg rates on the right, and her hips were not part of the problem. Motor exam was um, pretty much normal with the except of the right um, quad and, uh, and so on. Sensations intact, a little bit decrease in the alta distribution on the right, and her reflexes were symmetric. Um, we uh, preoperative imaging, which I'll show you um, in a minute, um, had four views of the lumbar spine, showed the L24 fusion, and she had an evidence of uh, scoliosis for disc collapse above the fusion without instability. The MRI showed an L12 severe foramenal stenosis with the um, asymmetric disc collapse. And you know, after um, making a, a decision to proceed with surgery, our CT showed uh, pseudoarthrosis uh, from L2 to 4. Um, I'll show you the images now. So this is her pre-op x-ray. Well, hold on, not uh, really a pseudoarthrosis, right? She probably was fused on one side and in the bodies. We did, there's a, yes, unilateral a... center, yeah. Perfect. And so this is uh, her pre-op films. You can see that's the, the scoli, um, AP lateral. Um, um, we get flexion extension. Again, we see no instability. Um, this is her MRI. And then in this one, I try to do my best to show the, the uh, um, asymmetric disc collapse on, on the um, right, right here. You see that there's no space on the, on the left here. You see significant space and, and that this is where her symptoms are um, coming from. Uh, evaluating the, the remainder of her levels, the ones that she had fused before and decompressed, perfect circle, uh, doesn't seem to be contributing to his um, symptoms. And then the next level, again, it was, you know, not a source of our pain. Um, we got the CT and this is where you can see this not perfectly fused. Um, and th that's why it was read as a pseudoarthrosis, but as Dr. Schroeder clarified. Um, so um, we ended up discussing with her what we we're gonna do. It took a long time to get her, uh, her case authorized through insurance. So it's pretty much one full year before we were able to operate on her. Uh, and the decision was uh, made to proceed with an L1 to x lift and a revision posterolateral 1 to 4 decompression and fusion. Um, because it was um, 
a, a high level. One, two, we had an um, axis surgeon perform the approach and they placed a, a chest to post up and they managed it. Um, this is intraoperative imaging. Uh, we perform an uh, one to X lift and um, placed a cage that, uh, that allowed us, you know, an indirect decompression and some correction of the deformity. Um, and then we uh, flipped and performed uh, revision posturality decompression one to four with effusion. Um, immediately post of the x-rays looked uh, great. Um, uh, you know, the screws were um, adequate. Um, the compression, the indirect decompression was, um, was um, adequate as well. And, and post operative she did well. Her pain was tolerated in, in, in the hospital. We um, sub Q heparin was her DVT prophylaxis. Her, her exam was five out of five um, by post of day two. Uh, chest, uh, the chest came out post of day two and she was discharged to home on post of day three for such a last surgery. That was a successful outcome. And we just saw her in clinic a couple of weeks ago and she was doing well. Her pain was gone on her right lower extremity and her motor exam was five out of five. And uh, we're gonna wait two more weeks before she can start her uh, physical therapy. Um, and now um, that's it. Uh, let's see if uh, Dr. Shorter has any more input to this case. Can I just ask quickly, why the chest tube? What was what was going on there that you needed a chest tube for her? Sure. I mean, so I don't. I oftentimes do my own exposure, but in this case, they actually had to take the T9 uh, rib to get in at the like right angle for her, um, just because she was so kind of asymmetrically collapsed at L1, L2. Um, so this was a transthoracic approach, essentially. Well, I mean, we, yeah, we basically had to go through, through the, uh, lung to get there. So you probably could have gone on the other side and tried <laughs> to do an X lift on the other side and tried to open it up and you wouldn't have had to go through the lung. But I was afraid with a 71 year old with, you know, 71 year old Northern European woman, um, trying to get through there. I was afraid I'd end up violating the end plates and have a lot more problems. You mentioned something at the end, and, and obviously a lot of us come from the degenerative world, not the deformity world. Why do you wait till six weeks post-op to start, to start physical therapy? I actually usually wait till about three weeks. I wait until their incision is healed. Um, so I, I think there were probably just something written wrong in my note. I, when they, I see them at their two week appointment, I give them a script for therapy. Okay. Any other thoughts? What would, what, what would other people have done in this case? Can you go back to the original x-rays again, please? Do you have the x-rays? Back one more. Let's see the AP film again, please. There it is. I, I probably would have tackled this one a little bit differently. Um, I, I don't know that I would be comfortable going through the chest to get to the lumbar spine here. And I would have probably revised her from behind first and use the instrumentation to get the correction, then let her regroup, so to speak, give her a couple days, see what her alignment's like, and then come back anteriorly in a straighter spine, which I think you could have done through a lateral extracavitary approach. So I would have probably staged this um, and, and done a reverse order on it. Oh, that's a great thought. I would that wouldn't have crossed my mind to do the back first. He's got pretty crappy looking bone though, Izzy. You, you, you would have trusted. Yeah, that's uh, the problem. The I, yeah. I, I agree. I think it's so much more powerful with the, the lateral approach in this case with bad bone where the best bone quality is really that apophyseal bone. That's the problem. I find it very hard to do that, Izzy. I mean, conceptually, I like that to, you know, kind of you can straighten them out and kind of re-instrument them and then fill them in. But I don't know the instrumentation holds that well in someone with bad bone quality. They can barely see their bone on the lateral x-ray. I'm just going to take I, I the opposite position of Izzy about everything tonight. So <laughs> you say what you want to do, Izzy. I'm going to say something else. I, I wouldn't <laughs> hesitate to augment those screws with cement, and you'll get plenty of hold with that. Um, 
we uh, we've become very liberal cement users with the fenestrated screws that are available now. And uh, I've been very impressed by just how much correction we can get uh, with it. Uh, I suspect you could also get a little bit, if you look at the flexion extension films, you didn't do lateral bending x-rays on her, did you? I saw the flexion extension. I, I did not do lateral bending x-rays on her. Yeah, but on the flexion extension, she's moving a bit on the CT scan, you don't see anything that's auto fused. I think a good facetectomy from behind, well placed screws, augmenting the screws with cement. I think you you do very well with that. How far uh, proximal would you go, Izzy, if you were using it for biomechanics? How many levels up? I would just go one level up on her. The, right. That that yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't cross to T twelve at all. I'd I'd just stick to L one. Doctor Hillebrand, you're a witness. Yeah. Yep. You think that would hold is? I think so. That's that's what I typically do. Um, you, you guys know better. I, I'm not one of these rod long, fuse short, or multiple levels. Um, symptom specific and get the get the biomechanics. What's going to hold her up is the anterior column when you get to it. It's not going to be your pedicle screws. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like stopping at L1. I worry about it breaking down at kind of a transitional level. But in this lady's case, I felt like smaller was better, um, even if small for me was a trans thoracic X lift. Like, all right, um, we want to go on to our last case. Sure. Alrighty. Uh, my name is William. I am the fourth and final fellow to present a case tonight from Rothman. Um, again, this is another one of the kind of trickier revision lumbar cases done here in the last month. This patient, the slide will go. It's a 73 year old female who um, uh, presented to us as a new patient uh, after previously having undergone an L2 to S1 uh, posterior lumbar decompression fusion about 18 months ago. She subjectively did well for the first six months after her index surgery, but since developed kind of recurrent right lower extremity, worse than left lower extremity, ridiculous symptoms in kind of the lower lumbar uh, dermatomes. Interestingly, another thing she complained of was uh, the inability to walk more than a block and the uh, progressive uh, requirement of assistive devices uh, for ambulation based on weakness and kind of some balance issues. Uh, she endorsed numbness, weakness, and tingling in the right, worse than left lower extremities. Um, let's see. There's my arrow. Um, past medical history that is pertinent is rheumatoid arthritis. She's only on Plaquenil for that. I uh, did not put osteoporosis on her past medical history. That is my mistake because she does have a diagnosis of osteoporosis and is on Prolia for that, which will be pertinent later in this case. On physical exam, again, she's unable to perform a heel gate, toe gate, or tandem gate, both from uh, her weakness as well as difficulty with balance. She has a well, <coughs> excuse me, well healed midline lumbar incision. Uh, to manual motor testing, she has full strength in her proximal musculature, but uh, starting at the tib ant and gastroc soleus, she is kind of gravity and anti-gravity um, strength bilaterally, um, as well as the extensor hallucis longus. Uh, to sensory exam, she does have uh, sensation intact to light and sharp touch. Special test, she does have symmetric um, hyperreflexia in the um, patellar and Achilles reflexes, but negative Hoffman and uh, no other long track signs. So this was the MRI that was obtained prior to her index surgery in 2019 at the outside um, hospital. And here is the x-ray that she showed up in our clinic with showing the L2 to S1 uh, posterior lumbar decompression with inner body devices at four, five and five, one. 
Based on her kind of gait disturbance um, and weakness, we elected to uh, get advanced imaging of her entire neural axis to look for some cause of uh, myelopathy. The cervical spine was fine, but you can see at T11, 12, she does have kind of a facet cyst there on the right uh, or kind of midline, which is causing uh, moderate to moderate severe stenosis. And then in the lumbar spine after, this is the MRI that we obtained. This is at two, three, again, kind of foraminal stenosis, three, four, same story, four, five, five, one. So kind of foraminal worse than, certainly worse than central stenosis. Um, here are the foraminal cuts left on the left, right on the right. And then to Dr. Schroeder's point in the introductory comments, the importance of getting a CT scan in these kind of more complex fusion patients kind of shows us the status of the fusion mass. But in this patient's case, you can see that her 5-1 inner body device has subsided into the S1 body. You can see some um, haloing around her S1 screws indicative of possible um, pseudoarthrosis at that level. So a lot of things to address here, um, kind of parsing them out by diagnosis. She has multi-level right worse than left for animal stenosis. She has that T11-12 facet cyst with stenosis and kind of clinical myelopathy. Um, and then she has an L5-S1 presumed pseudoarthrosis with a subsided T-lift gauge and complete loss of height. So we elected to perform first just, um, a 5-1 A-lift to uh, kind of get the T-lift cage out of the um, disc space and get in a, uh, a larger graft to restore height at the 5-1 space. We then uh, flipped her and did a uh, T10 to pelvis fusion, including a decompression of that facet cyst at 11-12, and then a, a revision lumbar decompression at the uh, foramen that were the most stenotic and symptomatic for her. Here are our post-op x-rays. Um, she again is about six weeks post-operative, so um, recovered well from the surgery, um, no major medical complications in-house and is um, uh, see her in clinic here in the near future. Yeah, so I, I saw the back of her leg pain's gone, so that's a plus. Um, so, all right, so what, what would you guys have done differently than what I did? For me, Greg, one of the big questions in these ugly redo um, scoliosis is, and yet this is a, a great case, and all of these are very instructive cases, is when do we use four rod constructs? And again, what's the underlying problem? So just going into this here right now, again, several of the panelists are writing, we should get long, long films, of course, we need to do that. But um, there's obviously a huge trend of this patient to want to do a trunk shift or a list towards the right and sag forward. So when would you resort to a quad rod construct to kind of um, uh, lock the lumbar spine, the sacrum into a really good alignment, then use neutralization rods for a longer fusion? Thanks. I personally use four rod constructs for all my osteotomies, but I don't usually use it if I don't need a three column osteotomy. I don't know if anybody else has an opinion on that. Yeah, and I've done three rods in the cases where I'm trying to do a deformity correction, like the case that Izzy said he would have done, where I would sort of have that extra rod to kind of distract on and lock it with another one. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't done it for this kind of a case. I think we're, uh, we're kidding ourselves. The, the answer to deformity is not more metal. The answer to deformity is strategic osteotomies, getting the alignment right on and making sure you get the fusion. Uh, you can put as much metal as you want, but eventually that'll break down. Uh, this is something that um, I probably, again, would have staged. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of staging these procedures. Uh, I take out all the hardware and I culture everything up and, and wait a couple of weeks to make sure there isn't any occult infection. Uh, we collected our series of cases and found that there was upwards of a 13% rate of occult infections in these revisions. And I just got very fed up being blamed for the infection when it was really an occult infection that was, that was in there. If we've proven that there is no occult infection, then yeah, I'd reconstruct her anteriorly first. 
Again, give her a few days to see what her alignment's like, get her three foot standing x-rays done, and then plan exactly what I need to do from behind to optimize that alignment. And the anterior also gives you a, a, a indication of how well your indirect decompression is. So I've, I just don't rush on these. I'll stage them as long as it takes. And I'll tell these patients that this is a, it's a book. It's one chapter at a time. You, you <laughs> read one chapter, you close it, you come back a week later, do the next chapter and do the next chapter after that. These are very, very long books, Izzy. But they're happy patients. <laughs> I mean, to me, some of the, the thoughts that I had about this case initially, too, were, right, did you guys see the initial films? Right? I mean, I don't think this person needed an L2 to S1 fusion to start out with. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what, why they had that. It looked like they had pretty severe stenosis from L2 to L4. Um, and they included all, everything else. Um, I also thought that, you know, titanium cages is an old uh, Northern European lady with bad bone. You know, it wasn't a huge surprise to me that those cages subsided and they developed a non-union. So I, I think make, trying to do the smallest surgery in patients like this the first time around, I think is pretty helpful. These are always tough cases, and uh, all the revisions that that we see, um, they're almost always because the first case wasn't done appropriately. The good news for those of us that do revision surgery is that no matter what, we're just trying to make it better. You know, the damage has been done, so we we proceed, we persevere, we take a lot of grief from our colleagues for doing this kind of work. Uh, but when, when the patients get a good outcome, it works, it works pretty well for them. And um, we, we've seen some good outcomes. So again, I don't hesitate to, to rebuild these ones. Greg, we've also had a series of uh, TLIF um, non-unions, um, mostly from outside, because we're, we're mostly A-lifters. Um, and, you know, when you look at your CT, you really uh, kind of scratch your head at how small the area of contact is between the implant and the end plate compared to um, what you get in an A-lift. So it's almost surprising. We don't see more issues with it from a mechanical standpoint. But fortunately, most of the time, as your experience, you can get them out anteriorly without... Uh, um, as, as big a fear factor as we thought at first. Yeah, for sure. I mean, particularly the ones that are not healed. I mean, they usually come out with a pituitary and I don't even think anything about it. Yeah, you know, I think the TLF is a, is a procedure that it's very easy to, to get sloppy with. You know, a lot of people depend on speed. They say how fast they can do them, but they're really not doing a great job. And as Jack said, if you look at the size of the implants compared to a nice size A-lift or even uh, one of the uh, lateral implants, they're really tiny in terms of the surface area that they contact. One other aspect of the revision cases, uh, we also audited all my revisions over the last uh, nine years and found that 30% of those that I take out their hardware on the first stage come back after and tell me, you know what? I'm good enough right now. I don't need anything else done. So that, that can help you out with some of these tough cases. Greg, do you have any more case? Otherwise, why don't we wrap up early and let everybody yeah. go look at the election results? No, yeah, that was it. We had four cases. So thanks, everybody, for all the help. You guys did great. Thank you. Yes, thank good discussion. you. Good night, everybody. All right. All right. Take care, Rothman, folks. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye, guys. Bye -bye, guys. See you next week. And bye for seeing the information. Hope your nominee wins. By the way, Linda, 478's not working. 478's not working. Okay. Megan, uh, let's give us one second, okay? No problem. 
Oh, she's fixing it right now. So stand by and we'll uh, put up a new number in just a moment. I don't know what I'm gonna do with all the CME though. It's more than more than uh, the computers can handle. Really, you don't? Do you, are, you have so much already? Yeah. All right. So four seven eight. It says eight. again. Let's try it again. She's all right. Well, mine it. took it work now. Four seven eight. Yeah, mine took Scott. Hold on. I just sent it. The four. It just sent it. The it sent it this time. It took Great. it. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Thank everybody. everybody. Tomorrow Let night, arthroplasty. Don't That's forget. right. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow night, night, arthroplasty. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay. See you guys. Good night. Good night, Thank everyone. everyone. Be safe. We appreciate you. Yes, you. You. same Thank here. You. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.